Once, there was a war. A war like none other ever before. A war cloaked in darkness, lit only by the flash of flares and searchlights. The explosions of bombs and the blaze of burning planes. For the first time in the history of human conflict, a war was fought between men and machines at night. It was a battle that neither side was prepared for. One where men risked their lives in planes which had only the most primitive electronics. And where night flying, let alone night fighting, was an unproven science. It became a war of accelerating technology and complex tactics and of great aircraft like the mighty Lancaster. Yet it began, as wars so often do, depending not on weapons, but on the bravery of those who fought. The giant bombers, they're being loaded up for the night's work. Every in 1939, at the start of the war, Britain was armed with bombers like the Hampton, the Wellington, and the Blenheim. The British Empire is building up a tremendous bomber force designed as the offensive air weapon to smash the heart of Germany. The propaganda films did not show how simple and vulnerable these planes were. It took the Luftwaffe to do that. On the third day of the war, the RAF set out to bomb the German fleet. 29 of these bombers took off. Of them, one third failed to find the target in bright daylight. Navigation was the first technical challenge of the early air war. You can't bomb what you can't find. Well, the earliest raids were a complete and utter waste of time. In the first two years of the war, we couldn't find targets. We'd only a compass and an airspeed indicator. There was no electronics. It was quite, quite impossible. The second challenge was more costly. A quarter of the bombers were shot down. They could not protect themselves with their few machine guns. Unescorted bombers were much more vulnerable than anticipated to Germany's fast single-engine fighters. Before Christmas, further daylight attacks had the same disastrous results. The bomber force was being decimated. Only four months after the war began, the RAF had to suspend daylight bombing. It was an initial triumph for technology, as the Germans had been warned of the bomber's approach by a primitive radar called Freya. It had a range of 100 kilometers and had been developed in the 1930s. Radar has not changed in 70 years. A transmitter emits a radio signal. When it hits an object like a plane, the reflection back can be timed and gives the distance, the direction, and the speed of the aircraft. Soon, the Germans were to discover that the British had their own version of radar. At the start of the war, Canada wanted to contribute and knew that one path was through the air. In 1939, the Canadian government desperately wanted to avoid suffering the kind of massive casualties that had produced a conscription crisis in the First World War. They believed that probably the easiest way to do this was to, first of all, emphasize air training in the safe skies of Canada. And the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan was established in December of 1939 so that Canada would become, in a sense, the aerodrome of democracy by training air crew from all over the Commonwealth and from those from the United States who volunteered to join the RCAF or the RAF. With bases and training facilities across the country and training year-round, the objective was to produce 20,000 air crew a year. Flying training began with aircraft which would not have looked out of place in World War I, such as the Tiger Moth biplane that was made of wood and canvas. Those are my best times, really, I think, because uh, I had a great time flying the little old biplanes, learning how to fly them, and uh, they were exciting times for me because I was an 18-year-old at the time.
The Link Trainer was the cockpit simulator of its day. It was designed to teach flying at night. Bob Dale was one of the first Canadians to use it. I joined the um, RCF in April 1940. I was 19 years old and went overseas in, in uh, December of the same year, December 40. We were the first group, I think, of the air training plan to go overseas. Later, trainees flew aircraft like the Stearman and the Cessna Crane, which was used to prepare pilots for the bombers they would eventually fly. The Canadian-designed fleet fort served as an aerial classroom for future navigators and wireless operators. The ubiquitous Harvard was the primary trainer for fighter pilots. Still today, veterans can recall the distinctive snarl of the aircraft they affectionately dubbed the Yellow Peril. Went to Dunville and flew Harvards. That's where I got my wings. Like so many young men, Pratt's destiny was beyond his control. I was supposed to have gone over as a fighter pilot, but the time I got over there, they were more on the offensive, so I was, they said the only excuse they had was I was too old. I was 20 to be a fighter pilot, so I ended up on the bomber pilot. The plan eventually created 47 RCAF squadrons overseas. Graduates accounted for over a quarter of Bomber Command's strength. But the war was not waiting for the Canadian airmen to arrive. After the fall of France and in preparation for the invasion of Britain, the Luftwaffe was given the job of destroying the RAF. In August of 1940, the Battle of Britain raged over the skies of the tiny island. those hurricanes and spitfires swept the air. How gloriously those few airmen rose to their immortal destiny. The Luftwaffe was learning the same punitive lesson the RAF had. In daylight, even escorted bombers paid too heavy a price. Soon, they would have to hide in the dark night. The heavy daylight losses of their bombers during the Battle of Britain forced the Luftwaffe to follow the British lead and bomb in the night. So began the Blitz. For a German bomber pilot like Hale Hermann, it was a new experience. A switch from tactical bombing by day, for instance, in support of the army to night bombing uh, implicated in a certain way a new philosophy. Bombing of factories meant to us that we were engaged now in a higher degree of warfare. The Luftwaffe had not designed nor equipped their aircraft for night bombing. The mainstay of the German bomber fleet was the Heinkel 111. Like its RAF counterparts at the time, it had a short range, only a thousand miles, and a slow cruising speed of 255 miles per hour. It was designed for tactical bombing and had a small payload. At 4,500 pounds, this was just one-fifth of the bomb load later carried by the Lancaster. When the Germans switched to night bombing, they were almost unopposed in the air. The RAF was not prepared for the night air war. It had to throw whatever planes they could into the dark sky, even outmoded ones. 
The Bolton Paul Defiant was one of the first aircraft to see action as a night fighter. It wasn't designed as a, a night fighter, it was uh, because night fighting hadn't been thought of. Um, it had been, it was a single engine aircraft with a pilot and a turret halfway down the fuselage with 303 millimeter machine guns. When the Defiant first appeared, German fighters got an unpleasant surprise when they made a standard attack on it from the rear. Later, they realized how unmaneuverable it was and shot it out of the daylight skies. They suffered very bad losses. But uh, as there were no night fighters as such, the Defiant, as it was available, were pressed into service. In 1940, navigation was very much by guess and by God. In daytime, lost flyers could hunt for landmarks on the ground. At night, for security, Britain had imposed a total blackout over the island. With every light source hidden, navigation at night could depend as much on luck as equipment as this British propaganda film showed. England! Black is pitch down there! Mind the blackout, dear. Anybody would think I was signaling to the enemy. Hey, cheer up, Heinrich. What's wrong? We are on our course, aren't we? Subject to drift! This infernal wind will blow us over our course if I can't see something to check up by. Look! Excellent! The navigational aids which make flying at night today so simple had not even been invented. That's by spiel. Dass äh, einmal das auch äh, ausgefallen war bei uns und der Flugzeugführer hatte so eine Art Blackout und fiel aus den Wolken und fing dann die Maschine wieder. Das war bei einem Angriff auf äh, Liverpool Birkenhead, dass äh, er auf einmal einen Kurs nach Amerika hatte und äh, es waren die, die Kompasse ausgefallen. Wir hatten ja manchmal Temperaturen von minus 50 Grad und äh, dann fielen etliche Geräte aus und äh, dann musste man äh, sehen, wie man zurecht kam. Jedenfalls äh, kamen wir dann so etwa mit dem letzten Liter Sprit noch nach Hause. A German propaganda film from the war shows that they had yet to make use of electronic instruments. They made it look far more accurate than it was. Wir sind 6 Grad links vom Kurs. 10 Minuten Verbesserungszeit. The Blitz marked the first major aerial battle fought at night. For the pilots trying to intercept the bombers, flying in the dark was very difficult and dangerous. They were the pioneers of the night air war. Well, initially it was a totally new experience. The feeling one got was that uh, any small turn in one direction or a climb or descent, one had to concentrate uh, very intensively on the instruments because the action uh, of the inner ear gives you the false impression that you may be turning uh, when you've actually recovered from the turn and you feel that you're actually turning the other way. Although looking at your instruments, your instruments are telling you you're flying straight and level. The navigation by night was quite a problem, uh, and I think uh, the bomber command, the British bomber command, has experienced it in the same way. Ah, the English Acosta. Against England, against the island, it was not so difficult as bomber command had it in against Germany, for we learned that. There's no British place on the island 
which is more than 80 kilometers from the coast. Towards the end of the Blitz, the Luftwaffe put into practice the first electronic technique, which later Bomber Command used with devastating effect, radio direction. It was a modification of the Lorenz beam, which is still in use today. It was based on the principle of two directional radio beams, which would cross over the target. The bomber would fly down one beam until it intersected with the other and drop his bombs. The Germans called this navigation technique the X system. The target where this was first tried out was Coventry. The cost of this technical innovation was 400 Britons who died in the attack. The night is long, but sooner or later the dawn will come. The German bombers are creatures of the night. They melt away before the dawn and scurry back to the safety of their own airdromes. The Luftwaffe thought it was safe in the cover of the night. But it was not invisible. The British could detect the German bombers coming, but they could not pinpoint them in the dark skies overhead. The application of science to warfare had begun before the conflict broke out. Both sides had developed radar. It changed the nature of the war. The British radar was called Chain Home. The air defense system was organized around its ability to see in the night as well as the day. Claire Quill became one of the highest ranking women in the RAF. She was a ground interception controller, directing night fighters like the Bow Fighter against the German bombers. And in those days, the rule of engagement was that you had to identify your target before you shot at it, which meant that the fighter had to get very close indeed. So how do we do it? First of all, we had to have a much better radar. We had to have a radar that would concentrate on one target. We had to have a fighter which needed a radar in the nose to get near enough to comply with this strict rule of you must identify. Airborne radar was the crucial missing ingredient. Only it could allow the intercepting pilot to find the enemy. The British scientists developed a radar which operated on the centimetric wavelength. This short length allowed the equipment to be fitted in the nose of a night fighter. This helped to retain the aerodynamic profile of the aircraft. German scientists were aware of its benefits, but were forbidden to work on it by Hitler. AI Mark IV sent out a signal which was received by aerials on the aircraft. And you had two tubes one of which would tell you whether the aircraft was above or below, and the other whether it was port or starboard. The technology was still primitive. The radar signal was not highly directional, and the bounce back from the ground could distort the response, giving a Christmas tree effect. You'd get a blip, a, a, a sort of triangular thing either side of the main line down the center of the tube. This was the end of 1940, beginning of 41. Uh, and the pilots found it a little difficult to believe that this stuff would work. It was a major advance, and some of the protection the darkness offered was being stripped from the German bombers. It was a danger that the Allies would soon face on the other side of the channel. The Germans had a high regard for artillery. Flak was their abbreviation for anti-aircraft cannon. By the end of 1940, they had more than half a million men manning their anti-aircraft guns. Adolf Hitler was a simple soldier. And to simple soldiers, the obvious solution to knocking down incoming bombers was uh, a wall of flak.
Hitler hatte eine ganz besondere Vorstellung davon. Er stellte sich Konferenz vor, dass einem angreifenden großen Bomberverband eine Mauer von Stahlsplittern entgegengestellt werden solle. In jeder Sekunde sollen Dutzende von Flakgeschossen explodieren. Ein General der Flakwaffe sagte, jawohl, mein Führer, das geht, dann müssen wir auf jeden Quadratmeter sechs Geschütze stellen. Dann geht es. Das ist natürlich Unsinn. The other thing was, a wall of flak was a visible demonstration to your own people that you were doing everything you could to provide air defense for Cologne or uh, Duisburg or whatever. In principle, the concept of anti-aircraft gunnery has been likened to hunting birds with a shotgun. Except nobody hunts birds at night. There were two techniques. One was to simply fill the night sky with high explosive and shrapnel, which was wasteful and essentially futile. The other was to illuminate the target and focus aimed fire on it. But the searchlights needed help to find the bomber in the vast dark night. In the era of modern warfare where thermal imaging and guidance systems can identify and track supersonic fighters, the German technology seems primitive but it was surprisingly accurate for the time. Forschgeräte wie dieser Richtungshörer C39 dienten der akustischen Flugzeugortung. Sie wurden von zwei Mann bedient, einer für die Seite, einer für die Höhe und eine gut ausgebildete Mannschaft konnte Richtungsgenauigkeiten von einem Grad erreichen. The sound locators were sensitive enough to pick up the Allied bombers as they were taking off from their bases in England. Und diese Werte werden dann elektrisch übertragen an den Flakscheinwerfer. Sie sehen hier einen Flakscheinwerfer von 2 Meter Durchmesser. These lights could illuminate a bomber flying 12 kilometers high. The German night fighters hovered in the darkness, watching the lights. Da waren die äh, Scheinwerferstellungen, die also die ankommenden Bomber dann aufnahmen und dann wurden die Scheinwerfer mit einem Hauptscheinwerfer eingestellt, äh, so wo sollten die kommen. Und wenn die einen äh, Bomber erfasst haben, dann kamen alle anderen Scheinbar war dazu und dann war der Bomber wie eine Fliege im Netz, in einem äh, äh, Spinnennetz. So war die eingekreist, sodass die da nicht wieder rauskamen. Getting coned by searchlights was a living nightmare for air crews. We were held uh, in searchlights after we had dropped our bombs and we were gradually going losing altitude under uh, very heavy anti-aircraft fire. All of a sudden, the anti-aircraft fire stopped, and uh, we were unaware it was a, a night fighter coming in while we were held in the searchlights. And he uh, badly damaged the plane and, and uh, injured our rear gunner. But somehow, he missed us. And uh, it was that brief time that we were then able to get out of the searchlights. The German anti-aircraft guns were not yet part of a unified defensive system. The RAF bombers did not face an organized enemy. That was about to change. During the phony war, before the fall of France, the RAF had restricted its efforts to dropping leaflets on the enemy. As Norway, Holland and Belgium were defeated, they began the night air war over Germany. At first, only a few bombers flew on their own and they caused little damage. But they gave some good news to the beleaguered British public. Returning from their targets, the bombers sometimes strafed German air bases. This annoyed a Luftwaffe pilot based in occupied Denmark. 
Wolfgang Falk had joined the Luftwaffe when it was still a secret force and trained in Russia. He flew the Messerschmitt 110 against the Wellingtons on their daylight raids. Und das fand ich so beschämt als Jagdflieger, wenn Bomber kommen, wegzulaufen, in einen Graben springen und Kopf einziehen. Das ist doch keine Jagdfliegerei. Und er sagte mir, wenn die Engländer nachts fliegen können und Bomben anwerfen können, dann müssen wir auch fliegen können und sie angreifen können. Remembering the ability of the primitive Freya radar to give an early warning of approaching British bombers, Falk flew out over the North Sea and waited for the bombers to return to their bases in England. We have it, I think, one or two times used. And they came back. The England, they were actually not yet fully trained. But they flew so deep into our place and shot at our machines that I just felt that I was going to Mut kriegte und zu den anderen sagte, rein in die Maschinen, hinterher. Drei von uns, dazu gehörte ich auch, haben auch geschossen, an dieser großen Entfernung, haben dann das Ziel aber verloren, weil die nach unten wegdrückten, in den äh, Morgennebel über See. Falk had discovered the two main ingredients of night fighting. Radar to guide the aircraft to the bombers and close cooperation with the ground anti-aircraft forces. This recipe for night fighting caught the attention of the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. And there was a Goering me a long monologue about the war and the situation. And that we were self-selfish to win the war, that was pretty clear. Dass nur ein paar unangenehme kleine Mückenstiche sind durch einzelne Flugzeuge der Royal Air Force, die dann irgendwo ein paar Bömmchen werfen und das wäre lästig und äh, ich sollte die nun bekämpfen und er nennt mich hiermit zum Commodore des ersten durch mich aufzustellen Nachtjagdgeschwader 1. The first Luftwaffe night fighting squadron was equipped with the Messerschmitt 110. Originally developed as a heavy fighter, it was clumsy and outmaneuvered by the British Spitfires and Hurricanes. As a Jäger war die 110 Kompromiss bei Tage und bei Nacht auch ein Kompromiss. Wir hatten keine anderen Maschinen. Die 110 war effektiv ein guter Jäger nachts, aber ein schlechter Blindflieger. Sie hatten ja nur einen Knüppel in der Hand, hatten kein Rad, mit dem sie besser fliegen konnten nachts. Und das waren schon Probleme mit der 110 nachts, ohne Zweifel. The Messerschmitt 110 was initially guided to its target by ground control. Later models added radar, and the cockpit could just hold a radar operator as well as a rear gunner. Its two Daimler-Benz engines gave it a cruising speed of 250 miles per hour, not much faster than the bombers it was supposed to catch. It was armed with two 20-millimeter cannon and four machine guns. A two-second burst could cut a bomber in half. Over 6,000 were built during the war. With drop tanks, their endurance was increased to two and a half hours. They became the aerial mainstay of a developing night fighting system, which the Germans called Heli Nachtjagd, or Illuminated Night Fighting. The German general commanding the night fighter force, Josef Kamm Huber, decided to set up a system of night fighter boxes, and the aim was to have one night fighter patrol a box about 20 miles by 40 miles. In early 1940, the Luftwaffe used it to defend the major industrial target of the Ruhr. Since the British at this time were making their own way to the target with very few aircraft, most of the time it ended up that you would have one bomber in one night fighter box at a time. And with searchlights and illumination, they hoped that they would be able to secure one guaranteed interception per box per night. The RAF bombers soon learned to avoid the areas of searchlights. After they added radars along the coast of Holland, 
They got better early warning and were able to get more night fighters into position over the German target city. But their radar was still based on the unsophisticated Freya early warning sets. A successful interception required more precision than it could deliver. To the hazard of Bomber Command, the Germans were about to introduce just such a piece of equipment. More than 50 years after the last night fighter sortie, there still stands one of the most successful technological innovations of the war, the Würzburg Giant. It remains a testament to the critical role radar played during the Second World War. Nach Beendigung der Entwicklung im Jahre 1940 wurden bis 1945 1500 Stück Würzburg Riese gefertigt. Der Würzburg Riese ist geteilt in einen Spiegel und in eine Auswerteeinheit. Der Spiegel hat einen Durchmesser von 7,5 Metern. Die Brennweite beträgt 1,68 Meter. Die Peilgenauigkeit war ein Viertel Grad. Die Reichweite, die man erreichen konnte, lag bei 50 bis 70 Kilometer gegen Flugziele. As the RAF learned to avoid the searchlight belts, the Germans developed Dunkel or dark night fighting. Radar control would lighten the dark skies for the interceptors. The Würzburg giant was so advanced that it saw service after the war. The antenna was used to make the first accurate measurements of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. It could also track a single bomber with deadly accuracy. I remember my first trip, uh, we sat in the Halifax the wireless operator sat just below the pilot, just slightly in front of him and below him in the nose. And uh, there was a little window on my left and I can remember we got uh, going over the coast of Europe, Germany, and uh, I looked out and the flak, I remember seeing the flak and I don't think I ever looked out again. I saw the tracers and everything, that was enough for me, I don't think I ever looked out again. The way the Germans worked, they had two ground-based radars, Wurzburgs, one of which tracked the incoming bomber and one of which tracked the night fighter. Information from the early warning Freya radars was sent to the divisional control room, which put it together with the closer plots from the Wurzburgs. All of the radar plots were given to individual women operators who were called Blitzmädchen, or lightning girls. They projected colored spotlights on the screen each one for a different bomber or fighter. On the other side of the screen, the controllers could see the spots on the map. And what they would do is they would vector the night fighter, and of course the red dot in the plotting room would show where the fighter was going, and the radar operator would gradually move the fighter, watching the plots on the uh, plotting table, into a position behind and below uh, the incoming bomber where the fighter pilot could make an interception. This was called the Himmelbett system, which meant a heavenly four-poster bed. The four posts represented the four pillars of the German air defense system, night fighters, searchlights, ground control, and flak. When a flak shell explodes, red hot metal rips through the thin shell of the bomber's skin. It hit me in the head. I had my helmet on at the time, and there's a scar on the, the helmet. And there's a piece of flak that I got hit with. It's um, quite a jagged piece of, of metal. Um, it didn't do that much damage. In fact, my crew, and here's when I reported that I'd been hit. The first thing the skipper said, any blood? And I said, not yet. I don't feel any. He said, where were you hit? And I said, in the head. And the navigator came right back and said, thank God, won't hurt him. Jokes. The Himmelbett system was in full operation by late 1941. Hitler had invaded Russia, and Allied bombers were falling out of the skies. The system was based on absolute trust between the ground controller and the night fighter. Einmal war es der Meyer, ein Oberleutnant, und das andere Mal ein Leutnant Jauk. Die beiden hatten, die strahlten eine Ruhe aus. Die war unwahrscheinlich. Ich habe das erlebt, dass ich mal nachts 
in einem Angriff gegen ein, eine Short Sterling, die also flach flog auf See, kam so verbissen und war dann weit auf See rausgetragen und wusste gar nicht mehr, wo warst du denn jetzt eigentlich? Wo bist du denn jetzt? Ich weiß nur, ich war auf See. Und dann bin ich nach dem Kampf auf Höhe gegangen und hörte dann also irgendwie schwach die Stimme von Meyer im Funksprechgerät. Und er brachte mich auf den Platz und brachte mich bis zum Platz. Und zwar beruhigend, wenn ein Mensch, also der von unten spricht, nicht aufgeregt wie der Reporter beim Fußballspiel, sondern ruhig ist. Das ist das Entscheidende für ein Jägerleitoffizier. By 1941, Bomber Command was growing in strength. The Sterling, the first of the giant four-engine bombers, had been introduced. The first graduates of the Commonwealth Air Training Plan had arrived in Britain. So I went over on the uh, Queen Mary. We landed at Greenwich, and from Greenwich we took the train down south to Bournemouth. And that's where I first got initiated into the smoking and drinking. There was a new impetus to Bomber Command, as well as new aircraft. The first version of the Handley Page Halifax flew operationally on March 1941. It was powered by the same Rolls-Royce Merlin engines which drove the Spitfire. They gave it a maximum speed of 250 miles per hour and a range which could take it to Berlin and back with fuel to spare. It carried 11,000 pounds of bombs, twice that of smaller twin-engine bombers, and enough to destroy a city block. The tail gunner in his turret was the main defense of the bomber. He had four 303 machine guns with 10,000 rounds of ammunition. Some thought they were inadequate against the German cannons, not Fred Passmore. Tremendous firepower come out of those four guns. They were small caliber, but they, each gun fired upward of 1,500 rounds a minute. So that's total firepower of roughly 6,000 rounds. He never fired for a minute. He couldn't you melt your guns, but it was a tremendous firepower. The mid-upper gunner had two and later four machine guns. There was a flight engineer to look after the Bristol Hercules engines, which were installed on the Mark III, as well as a navigator, wireless operator, bomb aimer, and pilot. I liked the kite very much. It was a, a real good aircraft, really sturdy, and got us home in quite a good case. The Halifax III came into service in 1943. With much more power, the ceiling increased to 20,000 feet and the speed by 25 miles per hour. The first Halifaxes would soon equip most of the RCAF's bomber squadrons. Already, number 405 had been set up and was flying Wellingtons. The threat to Germany was growing. The early raids of Bomber Command were usually made up of no more than 100 aircraft, which arrived over the target on their own. That's if they could find the target at all. In the early days of the war, once a target was selected and the groups that were going to fly on it were notified, the squadron uh, could pretty well pick its time over the target so that our particular squadron might be over the target from 11.15 to 11.45, that sort of thing, which was, uh, in hindsight, a, a very bad tactic. Hello, Mac. Where are we now? As though you're likely to know. 
I can't find where we are. We've come to Carl's Rear. Famous for its breweries, you know. Good old Mac. The RAF was so inaccurate that rumors spread in Germany as to why particular targets never seemed to be bombed. Von Flensburg wird behauptet, König Christian von Dänemark hätte in England interveniert, um die starke, einwohnerstarke dänische Minderheit in Flensburg von Bombenangriffen zu verschonen. In Merseburg ging ein besonders kurioses Gerücht um. Dort habe die Schwester des Grafen Luckner ein Haus gehabt und der Graf Luckner habe auf einer Seefahrt einmal Churchill das Leben gerettet und so wäre das Haus der Schwester des Grafen Luckner und damit die Stadt Merseburg, die in der Nähe der großen Farbenwerke von Leuna lagen, nie bombardiert worden. By and large, it was very seldom that we ever located a target in the, these first two years. In the summer of 1941, uh, a civil servant named D.M. Bott did a review of bombing photographs which showed that over some targets, and particularly the Ruhr in bad weather, a minority of crews were bombing within five miles of the intended aiming point. The analyst's report came as a great shock to the RAF High Command. In November 1941, Churchill ordered a virtual halt of all night raids. There were almost no attacks on Germany for three months. But even then, British scientists were testing the first of many critical developments in the electronic war. It was a secret navigation aid, codenamed G. Basically, it was having uh, a set number of, of uh, stations sending out a signal, which gave you two crossing lines at all times. The three stations sent out synchronized pulses. The aircraft had a receiver, and the signals would be displayed on a cathode ray tube. The signals were plotted on a special chart, and the aircraft's position could be fixed. There's no doubt that uh, G saved many, many lives, many, many aircraft. It was a, a wonderful navigational aid. As America entered the war after Pearl Harbor in February 1942, Arthur Harris was appointed head of Bomber Command. Press home your attack. If you individually succeed, you will have delivered the most devastating blow against the very vitals of the enemy. Let him have it right on the chin. It's been said that necessity is the mother of invention and war is the mother of necessity. At no point in history had it been so necessary for the men of science to help the men in the air.